Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. So, today we are going to continue on from what where we left at last, uh, last time. So, we started Fourier analysis <coughs> by giving you the idea of the eigenfunctions. So, we said that eigenfunctions are functions in a do domain. For this case of the signals, we're talking about the Hilbert domain or Hilbert space. So, the eigenfunctions are the basis of that space or the domain, and it means that all the signals or the functions in that domain could be uniquely sp spanned over these basis functions. So, they can be defined using these basis functions by shifting and scaling and so on. So, how many numbers of a uh, number of these uh, basis functions are necessary for a specific signal to be constructed? We don't know, but we can calculate it. But we know that using those basis functions in that domain, you would be perfectly able to construct that signal. One of the eigenfunctions <coughs> that we introduced was an exponential form. So e to the power of j omega zero, or any omega constant omega, n. That's the basis function in the time domain. We're talking about the time domain. So we actually fit this signal in the time domain with that form to an LSI system, linear shift invariant system, and we get the signal in the time domain which is a scaling version of the signal in the time domain as an eigenfunction that we fed through the system. So we have the signal in the time domain as the output of a signal in the time domain, but this coefficient is just depending on the frequency, omega. That was a good, actually the mathematicians already know about the eigenfunctions and the basis that was interesting for Fourier, to the Joseph Fourier, that okay, if this function is something that represents another domain for the signal, for example, if you have a time signal, then if it's able to represent something, a new concept, and that new concept is called frequency, then we would be able actually to see the signal with something rather than the time or the temporal properties. We can see the signal with its frequency properties or the components. So changing the omega in the input, we can get different coefficients here, and that will actually explain somehow how the signal behaves in the frequency domain, a new domain, which was actually attributed to Fourier, it's called the Fourier domain, but it means frequency domain. That's, the, that's something that's called the frequency response of this kind of system, LSI system. And this frequency response is nothing but, based on these calculations, simple calculations here, is nothing but this uh, summation or integration. So that's the integration which gives us the frequency response of a system. Here, h of n is just the scale, coefficients are scaling, and for different frequencies, you will get different responses. It's also called DTFT, discrete time Fourier transform, because it's only discrete in time. You have h of n, which is discrete in time, but you see that it's not discrete in the frequency. In the frequency domain, it's not discrete. Still, we are having omega, which is continuous in time, in frequency. So that's the problem. We are not able to use such kind of representation in the computer because it depends on the frequency in a continuous form. So if you want to record something in your computer in order to work with, you need to have <coughs> the discretized version of this. So the problem is not completely solved, but at least uh, partially solved. In order to go further, we need to know 
some new concepts. So we know that the frequency response is definitely because it, you have the summation of, of these uh, coefficients with e to the power of j omega, and e to the power of j omega is something complex. It has real part, Im imaginary part. That's why the result in the output will be definitely complex. So every frequency response, it has a real part and imaginary part. Another way of showing the imaginary and the real is using the magnitude, which is the absolute value of the amplitude, and the phase. So magnitude and phase, or real and imaginary part. As an example, we saw the unit impulse, which is shifted by ND samples. And we saw that for such kind of system, the frequency response is nothing but the shift in the phase. And how much shifting is represented here. So, in every new domain, at first we try to understand what exactly that domain does on some famous signals, some famous bases or some famous signals, then we can somehow generalize it over any other function, which is somehow constructed based on those basis functions. So the next one was a periodic sinusoidal signal. And we saw that if you apply this kind of signal, which is periodic, with that frequency and phase, and a constant value for the amplitude, what you get in the output is nothing but the same thing, except for the case that the amplitude is magnified with this value, and the phase is actually changed with this value. This is the, actually the uh, magnitude of the response, and this is the phase of the response. That's all. Then we have specifically talked about the Fourier analysis, the DTFT, discrete time Fourier analysis. And we actually saw the analysis and synthesis formula for that. So if, you, if someone gives you any general x of n function of time, how you will get the Fourier representation, the frequency representation of that. So you just get the signal x of n, and simply using this integration, you will get the frequency response of that, or the frequency representation of that. And that's the second one as a synthesis form. So every signal in time can be represented using this form of integration of the components, the frequency components of the signal which contains in it. So I already defined in such way that if you use, for example, uh, x e to the power of j omega, which is the Fourier representation, and d omega, if you con consider these two as the frequency component or the density of the signal, containing the signal, and this is just the basis function of that Fourier domain, integrating over the components in the frequency, or different frequencies, and then averaging, taking the average, that will give you the time domain signal. Or we can say the signal is actually synthesized, constructed based on those frequency components. The minimal frequency components in, that si in the signal. Okay, so today we're actually starting from this slide which we are going more deeply into the properties of the DTFT. Is that possible to get the Fourier analysis for every signal or not? So for every new domain coming up, we need to have more detailed study over that. Whether that's possible to get the Fourier analysis for every type of signal? Well, from now on, we see that, no, it's not possible to get the Fourier analysis for every type of the signal. But in some cases, 
using some kind of tricks, we can find a form of Fourier analysis for some type of the signals. But still there are quite a few of the signals that we cannot find any form of Fourier analysis. There is a property which is called the absolutely summability. And what does it mean? It means that the signal should have this kind of property. So if you just take the values, these components of the signal over the time, when n goes to infinity, this sequence should converge, or at least it shouldn't, it shouldn't diverge to infinity. If such kind of property is fulfilled, that means the signal is absolutely summable. And if it's absolutely summable, there are two consequences of this property that happens. One of the consequences is that if the signal is absolutely summable, then the frequency response x to the x of e to the power of j omega that exists for every frequency omega. So it's a good good news that if this is if the signal is absolutely summable, the frequency response exists for every frequency. The second consequence is that the frequency response is a continuous function over omega. So, on the other hand, if we have a kind of frequency response, x of e to the power of j omega, for any, you know, a specific kind of x, x of m. If that frequency response is not continuous over omega, then so I'm going from the other way, using a negative explanation of what I already used in the property. If, if, so here you see this, this idea is the idea of the Biobo stability, bounded input, bounded output. Here it means that if you have, if you have the bounded input, bounded, it means that doesn't go to infinity it never diverges so if the signal is bounded input it never diverges it doesn't go to the infinity widely then the Fourier transform exists also the Fourier transform is a continuous function over the frequency now let's have a consequence from the other way if this Fourier transform is not a continuous function over the frequency, it means it's not stable in the Bible sense. It's not stable in the Bible sense. How would the mathematical sense, like if this is not continuous, how would that affect in the time domain? Ideal filter. Sorry? The ideal low pass filter, okay. as an example. The ideal low pass filter. In the frequency domain, looks like this. You need something, for example, this is a low pass filter. Someone needs such, such a thing. That's the ideal low pass filter. Can everybody see it? So this ideal low pass filter says that I need a filter that this filter is frequency selective. What does it mean by frequency selective? It means that it just selects all the frequencies between zero up to omega c, the cutoff frequency. But it's actually zeros everywhere else. You just need this part of the frequency with the gain one. So every signal that comes into such kind of filter, the result is that all the frequencies of the signal within this range will be kept into the output, but the rest 
will be zeroed. But you see that this kind of filter is, is not continuous. You have jumps here and here. So the frequency response is not continuous over frequency. This kind of filter would be, based on this property, would not be Bible stable. It means it's not implementable. So if, if someone asks you to create a low pass filter like this, you see that it's not implementable. Just based on the theory, it's not implementable. What people do is normally approximating this. With some frequencies, they try to approximate this. And because of that approximation, something like this happens, which is called the Gibbs phenomenon. You can study at home, you can figure it out using the literature, why such kind of thing happens. And it's interesting that this overshoot that you see here is always 9% of the signal amplitude. So you will see definitely these overshoots here. As overshoot is unavoidable. So you can never go to the ideal low pass filter based on this theory. And we get this result that the stability of the system corresponds to the continuity of the frequency response and vice versa. Okay. Let's delve into absolute soundability with more details. Assuming that the signal that we have is an exponential form. The exponential form that we already defined in the form of a to the power of n, u, n. Step function, u, n. It means that the signal starts from zero time, initialized in the zero time. And then we have a to the power of n. So if you take the Fourier transform, and just use the definition of the Fourier transform series. What should be the result? Just replace that xm x of n here and into the power of minus j omega n as the basis function. And the effect of u of n, which means from 0 onward, so this becomes from 0 onward instead of minus infinity. You start from 0. Why? Because of the u n. And this is a geometrical series. When you write it down and simplify that, you come to this point. And this one is only convergible if the value here is less than 1. Based on this theory. So you have a series that goes to infinity. For a series that goes to infinity, you can have this only if the absolute value of a is less than 1. That's the only possibility. And this value being less than 1 means convert, is something that converges. That's the meaning of absolute summability. So, absolute summability actually gives us this opportunity for the Fourier transform of a signal to be existed. Let's see some of the transforms for some basis functions, for some functions, not the basis functions, some functions that are usable in, uh, in applications. One of them is the constant. Would you please close the door? Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you. So, one of them is the constant. For all n, just having x of n like this. So, 1, coming from minus infinity, we are all 1. 0, minus 1, 1, 2, and so on. The value is just 1. If you have such kind of signal, then what should be the Fourier transform? Well, the point is that 
This is not absolute summable. Is that? It's not absolute summable. It never converges, but it also never diverges. So for such kind of signal, you can define a kind of Fourier transform. And that Fourier transform actually needs to use the delta function in it. And one more idea that you can see here, e to the power of j omega, it has some properties. It's actually shown by the face of this, just this, this, this term. The face of the term shows us something. One of the things is that, just take care, e to the power of j omega, if I make omega plus 2 pi, what happens? Does it make a difference? No. Make it 4 pi, omega plus 4 pi. Does it make a difference? Or minus 2 pi. So it means that this term by itself is periodic. This is periodic. That's why if you use the delta function to represent that kind of series or x of n function which is actually not convergible but also not divergible what happens is that you have this delta function which is periodic and 2 pi periodic and r changes from minus infinity to plus infinity so we can define a kind of Fourier transform for such kind of signal which is actually not fulfilling the property we explained already And that's the proof. We can just simply go to this slide to see the proof. Just replace that and do the reverse process to see that the result will be 1. x of n is 1. And what happens for such kind of basis function, x of n e to the power of j omega n? For such kind of thing, we see that x of n is nothing but itself. So just put it, x of x to e to the power of j omega, the, 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 the Fourier transform is, you know, just like you have shifted the delta for omega zero. But still is, because of this phase, is still periodic, 2 pi periodic. So, here is the proof. And we can have such a thing for many different signals. And I have some of the signals already mentioned in the slides. For example, if you have the form of a k and e to the power of j k, j omega k, then the Fourier analysis will give you such kind of representation. They are more complex. You don't know, actually, you don't need to know everything. You can just uh, try it on for some, some specific signals just uh, to make sure that you have already learned how to work with the series. And for the unit step function, u of n, then you see that it's a kind of combination of the Fourier transforms. When you had one everywhere, you had a term pretty much looking like this and when you have just a, for example uh, the one value you have something like this so it's somehow just intuitively it's a combination of these two Fourier transforms something like that but you can also go to the com computation by hand to see what actually happens in order to get it there are some properties assigned for the Fourier transform, the DTFT. And there are some slides that are pending just for explanation of these properties. We have the conjugate symmetric sequence. So the conjugate symmetric is that if you change the argument from n to minus n, so reversing in the time, then the values are conjugate of each other. 
And we have the definition or the concept of conjugate antisymmetric sequence with this definition. We know from the time domain signals that every, every signal X of N can be represented or as a combination of a superposition of an even and odd part. Using this even formulation and the odd formulation. Which this one was called conjugate symmetric and conjugate antisymmetric. We still can't see quantum. Oh. <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay. So we have the signal. This this is the definition of the conjugate symmetric and conjugate antisymmetric. We have the signal as a superposition of every even and odd parts, which are defined like this. And in the Fourier analysis, we actually call, we, we never call odd and even. We mostly call it conjugate symmetric and conjugate antisymmetry. That's the new concept that's more useful. So, if you have a real sequence, real sequence which is actually the result of a real process, a real or natural phenomenon, then the real sequence is conjugate symmetric. You don't need actually to put conjugate here because for real sequences you don't have a complex value for the signal. If it's real, it's not complex. So the definition changes a bit and it's actually simplified. And so you have the odd sequence and even sequence. And for the real sequence, you know that exactly the same way you have the combination of even and odds with this kind of result. So, the Fourier transform we already saw that it's a complex, it's in a complex domain. So it contains even an odd in the form of conjugate symmetric and antisymmetric. So in the same way, you can use the conjugate symmetric and antisymmetric just with this formulation. They are sometimes useful if you have if you know some prior knowledge about your signal, then you can have some prior estimations about the Fourier analysis of that signal. For example, if you know that the signal is uh, even, then you know that that contains only cosine transforms and not the sine transforms. So half of the coefficients, you can just throw it away. It should be more compressed form of representation of that signal, which is even or even odd. So, if the signal is complex, like the electromagnetic signals, it has both electricity and magne magnetic form, which they are orthogonal to each other. And we will talk about the orthogonality. It's a very useful and important property of, you know, signals and systems. So you have this kind of properties. So if you have the signal which is complex, then the conjugate form of the signal in the time domain will give you the conjugate and symmetric form in the frequency domain. So if you have the signal in the time domain that gives you that kind of Fourier transform, then if you do conjugate of the signal, you will get such kind of Fourier transform this, of the signal, this result of the signal. And the same, uh, the same way for if you have a conjugate and antisymmetric, the then you will get such kind of thing. And the real, if, the, if you take the real part of the signal, which is in this form, then the definition for the Fourier transform would be like that, and so on. You can just easily follow it as a game And if you have a signal which is real, then simply you know that the even part of the signal is something that gives you the real part of the Fourier transform and the odd part of the signal or odd component of the signal will give you J times the imaginary part of that Fourier transform. One of the most nice and important properties of Fourier transform is that 
we already saw that the convolution in the time domain is unavoidable. So if you have a signal coming through an LTR system or LSI system, the result is nothing but the convolution. So you have the signal convolved with the system and that's the result, the output of the system. But you see that the convolution is a series. It's a kind of, you know, somehow a complicated operation. You have the shifting in time, then you have to you know, pass the signal through the other one, the filter, and then just sum it sample by sample in order to have the final result. So it's somehow in, in the literature something complicated. But the nice property of Fourier transform is that the convolution in the Fourier domain is just a simple multiplication. And that can be easily followed using the equation. So if you have the convolution, and then you take that convolution, use it and, you know, just expand the convolution and give it to the original formulation of the Fourier transform, what you finally get is that the output is nothing but the multiplication of the terms, any of these individual terms. So, convolution in time results multiplication in frequency domain. And that's very useful. That's why in most cases, for example, speech signals, you never try to do your processes in the time domain. Because, for example, you take the samples, that's the stream of signal coming, and that stream of signal, you cannot deal with the complete stream, which, for example, it can last for two days. What you do, you try for the small windows of the signal. We call it framing, or windowing of the signal. You take a small window, 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, depending on your application, and you take that part of the signal which can be seen in that small window. But then it means that that part of the signal in that window is actually convolved with the window function that you are using. Hamming window, Hamming window, rectangular window, whatever. And the result is a convolution of this filter with that part of the signal. Dealing with such kind of operation in practical form is really complicated. So instead, what we do normally is that we take that small windows, we go to the Fourier domain, and then it means now just the simple multiplication. You have the coefficients which are multiplied by, by each other. And then we do all processes just in the Fourier domain, simply in the Fourier domain. So that's the result of this theorem. Many of these properties you can find in Oppenheim book. This is part of the Oppenheim books that uh, I have scanned and put it here. So many other things I already mentioned. If signal is real, then what's in the Fourier domain? You, what, what you see from the signal in the time domain and correspondence, correspondingly in the, the Fourier domain, you can see it here. But it's more than that. It's just part of this which is mentioned. And also, if you have, for example, uh, like number one, which is a superposition of two signals, two different signals in the time domain, what happens in the frequency domain? Because it's a linear transform, again, Fourier transform is linear. Because it's linear, so it has the properties of superposition, homogeneity, and so on. So it means that combination of the signals would be the combination of the Fourier transforms in the, same, in the same format. And if you shift the signal in time, the only thing that happens is that the signal in the Fourier domain, the normal signal without shifting in the Fourier domain changes the phase. And changing the phase in the Fourier domain is represented by e to the power of j omega n, means the, the amount of uh, change, the amount of uh, shifting. And if you change it in the frequency domain, like this. So this is changing in the frequency domain, omega minus omega zero. Then what happens is that it's, you know, quite similar like to have such, such kind of uh, changing in the time domain 
phase in the time domain, which is, we cannot define like that, but the form is showing actually d to the power of three omega x of f. If you reverse the signal in time, like this, then you will get such kind of thing. Taking the derivative of the signal, the Fourier, in, this, in the Fourier domain, mean, means actually multiplying the n with the signal in time domain. And we saw already that convolution in time results the multiplication in Fourier domain, and multiplication in the Fourier domain results modulation in the Fourier domain. It's called the modulation. And we have the Parseval theorem. Parseval theorem is obvious, actually. Even, even though it's called a theorem, but it's obvious on the other hand. Because, why it's obvious? And what does it say? It says that the energy of the signal, what is it? That's the energy of the signal. Here is the variance, and you're summing up over the variance from the minus infinity to the infinity, so the entire length of the signal, what is it? That should be starting from somewhere, or it can be from minus infinity to plus infinity. The energy of the signal in the time domain equals the energy of the signal in the frequency domain, and it's obvious. Why? Because the transform, this linear transform, is lossless. So when you do the transform, it's just, you know, I give an example of changing my eyeglasses. Assuming that now it's, uh, for example, a day, and the sun is shining, and you're all sitting here. And I use the normal eyeglass, and I see everyone, and everything is okay. Then it becomes night, nothing is changed, the only thing is that I have transformed from the day to the night. So if I can use a different type of glass, for example, IR glasses, for example, then I can see everyone in the same format that I was, I, I was seeing actually during the day. Nothing is changed. So the lossless transform is something like that. Nothing is changed. You are changing your view to the signal, but that's nothing to be changed. It's quite different from PCA. PCA, you're actually losing part of the signal. You're forgetting about some part of the signal, the com some components of the signal. Just by the idea that those parts, maybe they're not important. So you just forget about some dimensions of the signal, assuming that they belong to the noise. So you're ignoring some part of the entities existent en entities of the signal. That's why they are called lossy transforms. So you cannot say that the energy is preserved in PCA domain. But for the case of the Fourier transform, Z transform, and so on and so forth, these are lossless transforms. Nothing is changed. So the energy is kept. You have the same thing, the same energy in the time, and the same energy in the frequency domain. And also, for a case of correlation, which is exactly the same thing, the correlation is the energy or the co-energy of two different signals in the time domain. You have the spectral or cross-spectral density, or the, which somehow represents the energy between two different signals in the Fourier domain. So you have the same idea. You have the same thing for single signal or for two different signals. So, the Parseval theorem says that the energy is preserved. And for all the linear lossless transforms, the Parseval theorem actually holds. Here we have the DT of t example for some, some noun sequences or the functions. Delta, I already explained, shifted delta, one, I already explained, or the exponential form, unit step, unit step with some, you know, kind of derivative derivation in the Fourier domain, or the sine and cosine, and here you have the sine function, 
is interesting. This the sync function is one of the most interesting functions. You see that the sync function in the time domain gives you ideal low pass filter. So ideal low pass filter is the sync function here. But how did we say that it's not implementable? It's not implementable because the sync function goes from minus infinity to infinity. And how can you implement that? You have to wait for infinite time to get the samples of the sync function and to use it as a filter. You cannot do that. You have to cut the sync function somewhere. And when you cut the sync function somewhere, it means that you don't have the ideal low pass filter anymore. And that's why, because you have cut the sync, sync function somewhere, you have just an approximation of the sync function, which correspondingly in the frequency domain, you have something as an approximation of the ideal low pass filter, which contains those overshoots. Gibbs phenomenon. Gibbs phenomenon. Yes, and there is another duality property here. If you look at these, you know, the sequences and the corresponding Fourier transforms more smartly, you see that you have the same function gives you the ideal low pass filter or something like that. Then if you have something like the ideal low pass filter, you should have it in the time domain, then you should have something similar to the same function in the frequency domain with some changes in the coefficients, which is already definable. So, you see that here you have the exponential form that gives you such kind of Fourier transform. Then go to the same thing in the Fourier domain. If you can find that, you see that in the time domain is quite similar. The only difference is that in the time domain it shouldn't necessarily be periodic. So, you see that the corresponding the number two is nothing but delta function. So you have a kind of duality between the time and frequency domain. And that's one of the nice properties of the Fourier. The Fourier transform and all the properties of the Fourier transform is so broad that even we have a specific course for the Fourier analysis in many universities in the departments of mathematics. So it has several applications, and we're just resorting to one, two lectures in DSP, but it doesn't mean that Fourier is already finished, and whatever necessary for the Fourier, we know that. No, there are a lot of more things that we, we don't know, actually, and they are so useful. So, some more practical examples. One of these practical examples that I mentioned several times was windowing of the signal. What actually means in windowing? You have samples. So you deal with the samples. Windowing in the case of the samples is nothing but having a kind of signal or the filter which actually starts from somewhere and ends to somewhere with a noun scale or the value. Assuming that this window is symmetric, you can start from minus n and end it to the plus n, and n can be anything. Depending on the time that you want to assign for that frame. For example, if you, you're trying to take the samples every, every, so with 8 kilohertz, it becomes every 125 microseconds. I think so, huh? 125 microseconds, it means that Every sample here occurs in 125 microsecond time difference with the other. And then you can sum 125 microseconds times how many samples you need to get 30 milliseconds. For example, it becomes 512, for example. It means that you have 512 samples from minus n to n with the unit value. That's windowing. But what we're 
interested in is how wind doing affects the signal. So, for a window in the frequency domain, in the frequency domain, just by replacing the values inside the definition of the Fourier transform, series of the Fourier transform, you will get this. And again, here you have a series, the geometric of four. And recalling from this theory, if you have a limited number of the limited number of the terms in a kind of series like this, then it can be converged to such such kind of thing. And you, know, you can actually study over that just by multiplying the denominator and the denominator using this e to the power of uh, the same thing, e to the power of j omega. Then you will come up with the sync function. We already saw in the two or three slides beforehand that uh, the window gives us the, or the ideal pass, low pass filter. Window function is something quite similar to the ideal low pass filter, but it's not a filter because it's in a time domain. So, but it looks like that, and because of the duality, because of the duality, even we have something quite similar to the low pass filter in the Fourier domain. If you make such, such a thing in the time domain, what you get actually the frequency domain is quite similar to the sync function. And uh, it's similar to the sync function, it looks like this. Now the point is that sync function, we are talking about the Fourier domain. In the Fourier domain, what is the maximum frequency? Omega equal to pi. 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 2 pi is the minimum frequency. 0 or 2 pi is here. Pi and minus pi, the highest frequencies, are the sides. So, it means that the, the form is like this. In the frequency domain, we have the form like this. So, it means that here, you don't have 0. And if you're somehow evolving over the time, the corresponding window in the frequency is actually creating a kind of jump here. And then it screws up everything. It means that the rectangular window is not a good window in the frequency domain. Because it would be a good window if it would start from zero and end to zero. But here you have a value even on the sides from pi, and you see if, if it's in the maximum frequencies. You see that if you change the window, there's something leakage from the previous window. There are lobes actually from the previous window. We will go through that in practical case. So I will give you probably a homework that you figure out what exactly happens. And the results, uh, I mean, both studying over the Gibbs phenomena and also different types of the wind doings, which actually try to recover the problem of the rectangular window. The more smooth window you use in the time domain, you see that those values in the sides start to be closer to the zero. Okay, so far we explain about the Fourier analysis. Do you want to have a break for five minutes? Your friend actually proposed to have a break because it's uh, continuously going on for one, one hour, 40 minutes or 45 minutes. He said that we can take just five minute break and then we can just be back. So you can have five minute breaks and we, we can have the Z transform afterwards. Thank you.